Welcome back to the White Coat Club. My name is Lindsay and I am a counselor at Moon Prep. Today I have two of my fellow counselors here with me, Darlene and Nicole, and we'll be talking about meaningful summer experiences and how to obtain them. And one last quick reminder, don't forget to like and subscribe to hear more great content from us. All right, so let's get started and let's get kind of started with the basics, because when we're talking about summer plans, um, which summers are we talking about? Does it begin all the way in eighth grade or ninth grade? Uh, what do you advise your students? I can start. Um, so I think like we had a lot of students who will want to really get started early. Um, I think definitely starting to make some plans for the summer before ninth grade, definitely the summer in between ninth and 10th grade. Prior to that, you know, those middle school years, definitely not as important, but keeping consistent and planning once you're at that high school level, I think is typically what I advise most students. Yeah, I totally agree. I think ninth grade summer is the best, like between ninth and 10th grade. Um, that's kind of when you're not studying for the SAT, you're pretty much done with your classes, um, done with all your APs. And it's a really great time to just explore because between 10th and 11th grade, you're really busy already studying for the SAT. And then between 11th and 12th grade, again, the SAT may or may not come back, but you also are planning for your college apps. So like Nicole said, as early as possible. <laughs> and I've had some kids who've started some like really cool passion projects when they were in middle school and then kind of built up on them over time. Um, if it like continues, I feel like that's kind of, as Nicole was saying, built as you go with like relevant experiences, if you're able to continue doing like a passion project or, you know, something along those lines, um, starting from when you were younger, that could be a good use of your time, but they won't care if you went to a summer camp in the seventh grade when you're applying to college. Now, of course, we're working with a lot of BSMD students here at Moon Prep, and a lot of kids are looking to get shadowing hours. How do you advise students to get shadowing hours? cold email. <laughs> email as many people as possible. Have a really good cover letter um, and resume. Your cover letter should describe why you want to shadow, what you're going to get out of it. Um, it's really a great way to really just show your maturity. Absolutely. I agree. And network. Talk to as many people as possible, whether you're babysitting or, you know, working as a cashier at a supermarket, talk to everyone. Hi, my name is, I'm looking, I want to be a doctor. These are my goals. Like I love anyone that, you know, you never know who knows other people and always have uh, your email on hand to pass out a professional email that you can give to people, um, send people your resume if they'll, if they'll take it and really just kind of put yourself out there as much as possible. Do you recommend students email or like reach out to a certain kind of doctor, like as a family practitioner more likely or an allergist or an endocrinologist, or do you think it just kind of depends on the doctor? I think it actually depends on what the student likes. So, you know, if your whole essay in the future is going to be about how you love cardiothoracic surgery, but you're shadowing dermatology, it just doesn't make any sense, right? It's not really a cohesive story. So I think they should be pretty selective about what kind of medicine they like to see, or even doing a lot of different specialties could be um, really interesting just to open up your understanding of what medicine actually is. I think being selective, but also be being willing to think outside the box. Um, and like, what are you looking to gain specifically? We talk a lot about what are you gaining from these shadowing experiences? Is it, I watch doctors do sutures or open heart surgery and I learn something about that? Or is it really the bedside manner and patient interaction? So if you're looking for patient interaction, you know, maybe going and taking whoever will, you know, take you and, and taking on those opportunities might be great. If you're really, I'm dead set on this specialty, I want to expose myself to as much of that as possible, then maybe you become a little bit more selective. I think that's such a good point too. The interpersonal skills are becoming so important. Uh, we were talking about this earlier, but you know, they will teach you whatever you need to know, right? So, you know, do they care that you've seen a bone inside a person before? Not really, because that's something you're going to learn in medical school, but 
the patient care side, you know, your bedside manner, that's not something that's easily taught. And they want those type of qualities before you even get into your undergrad and med school. Yeah, and something I think kids kind of forget about too is as a freshman, you might be starting to do shadowing experiences. When you're going to write your essays in your senior year, you might not remember those, the bedside manner of the physician or like an impactful patient that you saw or, you know, something that was really important to your journey because it was three years ago and so much life has happened since then. So this is really true for almost all of these examples we're going to give later on, but you should be kind of keeping a journal of notes about things that happened and like, you know, important stuff that um, influential moments to you or influential moments you saw between a doctor and a patient or whatever kind of opportunity it is. Take notes, write stories, and that will be good ammunition for later on when you're doing interviews and essays and things like that. Okay, let's talk a little bit about research. Because um, research is definitely something that most of our BSMD students really think is amazingly influential to their, their application. And if they don't have it, then they're not going to be competitive. Um, but as we know, that's not necessarily always the case. Um, now, a lot of kids will spend their summers doing research. Uh, how do you recommend students find research opportunities during the summer? I think going to university is a really good way to get research. Uh, obviously, there's two ways to do that, right? So one is a program. Um, another would be just, again, cold emailing, which no one likes to do, but I promise it's really effective. So applying through a program is very expensive. We've seen these things range for anywhere from $3,000 to $10,000. And it really depends on the quality of the program, right? Are you just going to be sitting in a classroom and just learning something? Or are you actually going to be hands-on? Well, if you're just sitting there in a classroom to learn something, it's not really different than just being in a high school classroom, but people often are just so focused on the name. But for the really hands-on stuff, um, you know, sometimes you do get one-on-one -on -one mentorship, which is really valuable. But oftentimes you're also just shadowing in a lab. Uh, maybe you get to do a couple cool experiments, but again, you know, these things are pretty expensive. I usually tell students to hold email professors first, right? And one of my students actually emailed a bunch of professors in California. And as a sophomore, she's going to be working with a Stanford professor for the next three years. So the cold emailing, I feel like yields a lot better results sometimes, especially if you're really persistent about it. And um, it's actually kind of nice when you're able to have something more long-term versus just, you know, a couple months in the summer. Yeah, I always call it the brute force method because if you put enough brute force into it, you're gonna eventually be able to get in. Of course, like during the pandemic, it was a little less likely, but now that the pandemic has kind of subsided, it, there's there's a lot of opportunities if you're willing to put forth the effort. But that's the thing is you have to be consistent about emailing and actually try. If you just email one or two, you probably, you probably won't get that opportunity, but I have had kids kind of similar, have some really cool opportunities using that brute force method. Yeah. Also going back to, if you're going to do a program, really think about, you know, what type of program and what you're going to get out of the program. I know some will offer college credit. Um, is that really worth it? If you get into a BSMD, are they really going to accept those credits towards something, you know, toward your degree? Um, some offer publication, not a lot do, but are you getting exposure to a topic that you're actually into, or is it just a program at a top name university that you just want the name from it? Like Darlene said, or is it actually a research topic that you want to continue working with? Yeah, that's Go such on. a good point. I had a student this year who went to Harvard summer school and didn't hear from any BSMDs and Harvard Summer School, I think, has a six percent acceptance rate. So that that was really interesting. That the name is not as important as you may think it is. And to that end, too, is you know, some I had a parent just earlier this week who she got rejected from two of like her more competitive summer programs, and she's like, "Is this indicative of what the BSMD applications are going to look like? Um, are we going to get rejected from everything? Is it even worth it?" And so it's important to remember too that. 
no, of course, different people are going to be evaluating the application. So the Harvard summer program could have been looking for something very different than the BSMD programs and, you know, vice versa. And, you know, it could just be different priorities. And of course, if you're only applying to two, you could get rejected. We're going to do, we're going to do a lot more BSMD programs, like 10 to 15. And so that's going to really change to what, what your chances are of getting accepted to at least one are going to be. Now, what about independent research? Do you recommend that as a good way to spend your summer? I think it's a really good way to supplement what you're doing already. Um, and it really depends on how big the project is. So if it's a smaller project, I would definitely supplement with like volunteering or something like that. Um, but if it's a really big project, like I think on one of our other podcasts, we talked about a student who was in the basement and working on designing like a sleep apnea machine. <laughs> I think that is a pretty big project itself and it kind of stands alone. I think if they have the opportunity to, I know a lot of students will travel over the summer and want to take advantage of being in another place. And, you know, they might have means to different ways of research and go for it. Um, but definitely as a supplement, um, and really being thoughtful and how you're going to portray that later on, on your applications. Now, volunteering is another way, a good way to spend your summer as well. Um, what do you recommend about volunteering hours? Where should students be volunteering? My rule of thumb is really anywhere they like. So if you're really passionate about like food insecurity, the homeless shelter or the soup kitchen is a great place. Um, I had a student who was really successful this year with BSMD, and when she heard about domestic violence in her community, she literally sat in front of her lawn and raised $9,000 over the course of three years, and that was just such an impressive story, and you could tell how passionate she was about it. So volunteering, I think, comes in all different forms, right? You could be at a hospital, at a hospice but you could also just be out in the community doing good. That's crazy. That's really crazy. Yeah. <laughs> That's a lot. I completely agree. I mean, a lot of families will want medically related, you know, they want us to look in that field and they want the work that they're doing to be, you know, related to that field. It doesn't have to be at all. It could be anything and it can also be a combination. Um, I've used this story before. I had a student who was volunteering in a nursing home. Um, you know, doing tasks as a nursing home. And she also had a really big passion for the violin. So to supplement her going into the nursing home and helping with activities, she decided to bring her violin in and she was able to kind of join both of her passions together. Um, and she did like a summer concert series for them, which was ended up being great. It was an awesome thing to write about on her application. So if it makes you feel good, keep doing that thing um, and, you know, find more ways and creative ways to keep doing that thing. Yeah, one thing I like to tell people too is try and be consistent with your volunteering. Um, I had one a student a few years ago who had done a lot of like one-off volunteering. So he had volunteered kind of like through like the key club where you go maybe to the animal shelter one month and then the next month you're at, you know, a homeless shelter and then the next month you're doing something else, you know, whatever it might be, which fine. But then, you know, whenever we were like, okay, tell me about anyone that you like really worked with anyone you impacted anyone you helped like why were you doing these things and he's like well I was required to do it for school so like you know I was mostly just talking with my friends and there and you know doing things and wasn't really having like an impactful experience and it was very obvious like just based on talking about him that the depth wasn't very deep at all of like these volunteer experiences and so whenever you are thinking about volunteering you know try and think about something that you actually do want to be doing for like a long term to be building those relationships if possible. And that, of course, everything needs to be super long-term, but, you know, you do want to have some consistency with your application. And so if, you know, you don't like volunteering with the elderly, maybe the nursing home or hospice isn't the right place for you. And that's totally fine. You don't have to be doing these things. Um, or vice versa, like if you do really love volunteering with them, go, go to the nursing home. So think about things that you like to be doing and try and be consistent with them and, you know, go long-term and be volunteering because you like to do it not because you're checking that box or because, you know, you need the school hours for National Honor Society or Key Club or whatever it might be. I love that you're talking about people who are just doing things that they hate because, I don't know, I just feel like you have so many hours in the day, right? So why would you spend 
time doing something you don't like when you could be spending time doing something that you do like. And so I don't know, I think with BSMD, there's not really like a cookie cutter checklist type of thing as people really think there is. But I don't know, I think that if you just follow your passions, right, and you're able to demonstrate that, that is what makes people actually stand out. Literally what I say in the new client calls now, I'm like, there is not like four things you do, like a checkbox that you do those four things and you're in. I'm like, it would be great. Our job would be so much easier, but it's not like that. And so that's both the bad thing and the good thing, because then we can follow passions and you actually enjoy your high school experience and your college experience and beyond, because not everyone should be, you know, looking and doing the same thing. So yes, just because one kid did something doesn't mean that if you do the exact same thing, you're going to get into that school as well. I've had a lot of people who said, okay, well, I saw this girl got into the Brown like cleaning program. She did X, Y, Z. So I'm going to do that exact same thing. And I'm going to like, kind of try and replicate her application. That is not going to be a key to success because she did those things from a place of passion and interest and probably will do them a lot deeper and a lot more you know, ultimately in depth than you would because you are just doing them to do them. And passion, as I'm sure we've talked about a ton in this podcast, is what admissions officers are really ultimately looking for a lot of the times. That's so interesting that you bring that up too, because they don't want the same blueprint of everyone, right? That's the whole point of diversity. <laughs> and I feel like it really shows in the essays and definitely the interviews. When you talk, when you're, we're having essay conversations with a student who's going to talk about a volunteering experience, it's so apparent to me and I'm sure to you all as well when they enjoyed it and they were really passionate about it versus, yeah, I went here and this is what we were tasked to do versus I met all these people and I love doing it. You can really just see the passion kind of come out of them. So really, really focus on things that like evoke that feeling versus checking a box that is really not a box that needs to be checked. I think this is the perfect transition into another thing kids can fill their school with, which is passion projects. Um, as you can guess, passion projects you should be passionate about. Um, what should students be doing with passion projects over the summer? Cool thing about passion projects is because it could literally be anything. I know we have a lot of students that publish books or will start, you know, a non for profit organization, you know, about something in their community that they are interested in or, you know, passionate about. <laughs> um, but you can start as soon as you you want to. A lot of students, we talked about middle school, how, you know, it's not really important to start in middle school, but a lot of times it'll be a really small thing that they just continue to build on as they go. And then, you know, maybe they do a little bit of work in ninth grade, a little bit of work in 10th grade. And then, you know, by the end of 11th grade, they have this full-blown thing that they can show the growth of. Yeah, definitely. I, I'm thinking back on a lot of different students right now. Um, there's some people who just find one specific cause or topic that they're really interested in, and they kind of just see where they can take that project, right? Like, I think, Lindsay, you had that student who did the period project. I had one. I think Nicole's had one as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so this student um, or students, they were really passionate about girls not having period products and that inhibits people from going to school. And so they raised a lot of money to purchase period products and donate, donated them, I think, both domestically and internationally, right? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Yeah. And that's like kind of the good thing about it is, is they're helping out a community that's important to them. And that's one thing that we've done from like our interviews with like admissions officers is they, they want you to think about your community and who you're helping. So like my one student was from like Southeast Asia. And so that's where she was donating products, but then she also implemented some like in her, um, like the bathrooms at her own school too. So it was kind of like a two front, you know, an attack on purity period poverty. And so like that can be like a really great way to, to be really helping out your community and spotting a need that needs to be filled. I like yeah. that you said that. I think so many times people think that they have to like go big or go home, right? But you can always start small and it's just as meaningful because it's your specific community. I think oftentimes people are like, let's just automatically go international. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of it's evoked from them going and visiting family or, you know, a lot of times over the summer, the parents will already have trip plans for 
like months at a time, or weeks on end. So while they're there, they're recognizing, you know, the differences and the similarities and saying, you know, how can I do something that's going to help them in this community? And then also something that can be relative in my home community also, like Lindsay's student. I had one student even like raise money to plant trees abroad, which I thought was really interesting. So it's not really medically related, but he was just so passionate about the environment. Um, and he did go to a BSMD, but yeah, I was like kind of blown away when I heard that. Yeah, one of my favorite passion project examples is I have one boy who like started, it was like kind of in the height of the pandemic. And so like the tennis team was canceled, like he was a coach, for like a special Olympics team and that was canceled. So he's kind of figuring out ways to still express his like interest in tennis and like still do something related to tennis. And so what he started doing was teaching like lessons, like one-on-one -on -one lessons to women over the age of like 45 or something like that, who didn't have any previous tennis experience. And so obviously not related to medicine at all, but we actually used it a lot in his essays and in his interviews because like he learned a lot of like those soft skills that a doctor is going to need to do because at the beginning, obviously he's got a lot less life experience, but a lot more tennis experience than these ladies. And so he didn't have the confidence to like, you know, tell them you're doing X, Y, Z wrong. And so whenever the, the women were competing, they weren't doing very well at first because he didn't have the confidence to like kind of step up and, and talk to them and like be a proper coach. And so as a physician, of course, you're going to be treating people who are going to be much smarter, much older, you know, much different from you and learning how to communicate with people that are different was like just such like an important skill for this, you know, 17 year old boy to gain that it actually was like really influential. So sometimes passion projects not related to medicine can still be really valuable because you're learning those, those skills that can ultimately be applied later on too. That's an awesome passion project. <laughs> it was, it was such an interesting one. i really no clue how he fell into this group of like how, how he found these like women over the age of 45. <laughs> That's when it made me chuckle, but who knows? He, he really loved it though. That's awesome. I think that's the whole point. You should really love it. Yes. <laughs> and something I think parents forget about, they're like, okay, what's the most impact we can have or, you what's know, gonna what's, look the best? what's going to look the best. What looks the best is what you're passionate about. Mm -hmm. and passion projects. And teaching is such a good way, just like your tennis example, like a lot of students, I think, will start like nonprofit tutoring companies um, or just like tutoring services around their community and really engage them in a topic they, they really like, right? I have a student who self-taught himself calculus from the MIT courses, and now he's just tutoring people around his community just because he loves math so much. And yeah, it could be something related to um, like academics, but I had one girl too, who like her kind of whole passion project, I would say was like working with people with, with autism and I guess disabilities in general. And so she worked for like a, an online company where she would like teach them how to like cook and like do like sewing and things like that. So like other skills too. Um, but she had a lot of activities kind of related to working in that community. She did Taekwondo where, you know, a lot of times, um, it's not necessarily meeting the kids at their, their need level. And so she would really like break it down and make sure that she was working with the kids one-on-one -on -one and helping them, you know, get to the next level of what they wanted to achieve. So, you know, it really taught her, I think once again, those like valuable skills of, of meeting people at their level and learning how to communicate and teach, teach properly too. Let's kind of shift gears a little bit. Um, some parents will always ask us about taking community college courses. Is that a good way to spend your summer? I always say it depends um, if you're looking for something specific. So a lot of times students will come in in ninth grade with a specific math. And if you're not in an honors level or, you know, a grade above in that math course, then you're not going to be able to take, you know, AP Calc um, in that senior year or maybe in that junior year if you also want to save room for AP Stats. So sometimes students will say, I didn't realize that, you know, not having the honors in eighth grade was going to have this much of an impact later on. Let me take a math course at a university over the summer. Obviously, always talking to your school counselor and every school is going to have their own stipulations about this, but potentially taking a course over the summer to meet a math requirement to then jump you ahead. Similar with sciences, you know, some schools will not let you take AP bio unless you've taken regular bio and there's just not enough years um, to take everything. So if you're really looking to take a specific course, 
um, it could be really great to get ahead by taking something over the summer. I think it's so interesting that there's been kind of like this narrative, like it's like a totally new concept, right? Like when I was in high school, no one really did community college right away. But now I feel like everyone I talk to is doing community college. Is that something you guys have noticed too? <laughs> so I don't yeah. know. I, I don't think, I don't think it will hurt you, but I don't think it helps as much as people think. And I think it goes along with the passion part, right? If you're really passionate about a project that you can't, or sorry, a topic that you can't get in your classrooms, then I think community college makes sense. But if you're kind of doing the same things, right, you're just taking another science class, another math class, how much of a difference is that really going to make? And a lot of the times, I don't feel like it makes as much of a difference. Yeah, I think a lot of kids will want to take, you know, anatomy and physiology because they are going to say, oh, I won't have to take it. You know, Darlene, you probably speak more, but you're definitely going to have to take those courses again. Um, but if one of your passion projects is photography and your school doesn't have photography, but you want to really learn the skill and it's something that you have a passion for, go for it. That's so true. I think from an admissions perspective, if I saw that, I'd be like, oh, okay, photography is definitely new and different. Like I haven't seen that before, but you know, everyone taking anatomy, you're going to have to take that in college, right? So there, I think taking it too early can harm you because medical schools want you to take stuff within your college years. Um, they don't even want you to graduate early because they understand that college is a time for you to grow your skills. You don't have to pre-grow your skills in high school. That's kind of similar to what I always say is that you have nine months out of the year to sit in a classroom and learn. Like, why would you want to spend like your three months into the summer, like the time where you can be going out and like developing some of those like other skills or like applying those skills that you've been learning or just like developing as a person? Like, you know, sitting in a classroom won't necessarily help you too much with that. So I'd rather kids go out there and be volunteering, doing passion projects, you know, research, whatever it might be, seeing, seeing a physician in work than sitting in a community college learning anatomy and physiology. Now, as of right now, SAT, ACT is still required for almost all the BSMD programs. Of course, who knows what it'll look like in the next couple of years. But standardized testing studying is definitely something that kids spend time doing over the summer. Mm -hmm. What summer should kids start doing it? How should they be studying? What do you kind of recommend about standardized testing over the summers? I would say between 10 and 11, really, really focus. A lot of our students will test for the first time. Some will do late in 10th grade, but a lot of them, I think the bulk majority will start early 11th grade um, or even like the summer right before 11th grade. So I think jumping into summer really focusing on that um, during that summer is key. That's the same time I usually recommend too. And make sure you take practice tests. <laughs> Do not take the exam without knowing what your predicted scores are going to be. Yes. I always love when my parents are like, well, we're just going to take it cold and just see what happens. But then you're wasting one of your chances. Like school is very, well, still see it. Sometimes they require you to send all your scores. Like why one paid money to not do well on a test and like wake up early on a Saturday when you can do that for free at home. So that's one thing that I completely agree with. Don't, don't just take it cold. And the earlier kind of the better, depending on like where your math is at and things like that, just because I think that it is an easy, a test that will ask easy things like in hard ways. And so the more, the longer you wait almost, I think it gets worse because then you get in this mind game of like, oh my God, I need to get that 1500 or that 1560 or whatever your kind of goal is. And the more pressure you put on yourself, the even harder it gets. So I'm kind of with the philosophy, the earlier, the earlier, yeah. the better. but depending on, of course, like where your math skills are at. One question I always get is, do I have to take the SAT and the ACT? What do you guys think? No. Yeah, I agree. I, I say familiarize yourself with both, you know, do the research a little bit um, and then, and then decide to prep for one. Um, if you're really, really struggling, if you're studying for the SAT for the first time, like you're taking practice tests, take the first one and it just 
was not what you expected it to be and it was really overwhelming, maybe reconsider the ACT or, or vice versa. Um, oftentimes, you know, your school will offer either one or the other. So they'll have to take one or they'll have already taken a PSAT in 10th grade because their school requires it. And they're kind of already ready for that. Um, but you don't definitely don't have to take both. I would agree. They're very similar, at least right now, up and through like, you know, the beginning of 2024, they are very similar exams. And so you can a lot of times like transfer your skills over from one to the other if you aren't doing well, as Nicole said. Um, and I would agree, do like a practice test in the SAT and ACT first, because the timing is really different. Some of like the different sections, mm -hmm. um, ACT's got the science section and the SAT's got a bit more math. I think the reading section on the ACT is a bit easier, but you have to be quicker. So it just kind of depends on like what's best for you. Um, I know I took the SAT growing up. And if now that I know more and if, if I were to change things, I would totally take the ACT because I think that fits my skills a whole lot better than the SAT. But I did not have a counselor to tell me these things. I didn't even really know what the ACT. I lived like in a state where the SAT was the norm. So I just took the ACT or sorry, I took the SAT. So going back, I would probably change it and probably do a little bit better, but you know, that's just how it is. And so that's why doing like the research beforehand for yourself can really help. Let's talk a little bit about the impact all of these different summer activities that we've been talking about have on your college applications. Um, what would you say, Darlene? I think it's definitely important to plan early and plan it well. Um, I definitely have some students who haven't done any activities and I think from an admissions perspective, if you think about it, you're like, okay, this, you know, the student is really good at studying, right? But they're not good at anything else. And before, I think the history that we've seen is if you get really good scores on your SAT or, you know, all your high school classes, then you'll get into a really good school. But at least what I've noticed is things are starting to evolve. Even if you get good grades anymore, or even if you don't have good grades, that doesn't mean you're going to get in or not get in, right? It's more about your community engagement. Um, one of our counselors, Josh, I think put it the best when he said, they're looking for someone who can make that immediate change right now. And I feel like that's how I kind of centered all my advising from now on. <laughs> Agree. Do things because you want to, as we've said a million times, do things because you want to um, try and gain some like skills along the way too, if you can. I think that that's always really nice. As we talked about, if it's soft skills or like, you know, you learn how to code an app, fantastic, or learn how to do research. All those kind of things are just going to be like good hands-on ways to then be able to make that impact right away, starting in your university years. So obviously we're kind of well into almost the summer actually. Um, well into our summer planning for our students. So for some of our students, like, you know, finding summer programs, it's gonna be impossible because a lot of those summer programs are already canceled. Maybe volunteering at a hospital is gonna be impossible because it does take some time to get approved. Um, you might have to start in the fall or whatever it might be. So let's talk a little bit about what kids can do for next year, how to plan for next summer. I like that you're bringing this up early. <laughs> yeah. I think, you know, in the fall, once school settles in, you know, October, November, really figuring out, okay, recapping this past summer, what did we do? What did we like? What did we, did we not achieve that we want to achieve and start researching like in the fall for the following summer? Uh, we talked a lot about keeping things relative to each other. Um, so it kind of all feels a little bit cohesive when you're taking all of your opportunities, you know, together. So um, definitely fall before summer yeah plan ahead it's longer than people think I think oftentimes people are like oh I'll start planning my summer in May by mm -hmm. May it's too late every application is closed in March or April so yeah Nicole you're totally right start early <laughs> early and even like you know a lot of the really competitive stuff will close in even December or January and so even if you start in January thinking you're ahead you might be already behind so start thinking about it. Just start thinking about it now, or, you know, even if, as you're going along and looking for summer program applications, you're like, oh, this one closed in December, like snooze it in your email until November or whatever the application opens for next year, or keep a running list of stuff that you're interested in for next year, whenever you're old enough or whatever it might be. And then those things 
can just start to build up your list as you go along. Well, I think that's it for us today. Um, thanks so much for joining us to learn more about your summer planning. Don't forget to like and subscribe to get more content from the White Coat Club.